I am Kyun Lee. Uh, I'm based in Seoul, South Korea. It's where it's 11.30 a.m. right now. Um, I am a training and curriculum manager at Solution Journalism Network, and I manage our Train the Trainers program, uh, Solution Journalism Network's Train the Trainers program, and steward our global communities of practitioners uh, okay. and Solution Journalism trainers. Excellent. Thanks so much. And we're so excited by the uh, partnership that we've formed with the Solutions Journalism Network here at the Walkley Foundation to offer this program. And uh, if you stay until the very end, you'll learn about some training that we'll be offering next year um, and some other goodies. So very, very exciting times ahead for um, both of our organisations <laughs> and what we're doing in Australia. Um, and also for the region, we have, I can rec I can see people in the, um, in the participant uh, list uh, from various parts of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, mm. Yep, so that's wonderful. Really a, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, and some of the names I recognise are also not from journalism, which is also very exciting. So um, we might just quickly uh, touch on that and then we'll get started, Q. There is interest uh, with uh, in solutions journalism from NGOs as well as, or, you know, organisations outside of journalism. Do you want to just speak to that for a moment? Absolutely. I mean, solution journalism doesn't only speak to journalists. In my case, what I find surprising and interesting is that it's audience first. People like it when you talk about it. People just get it immediately. Um, that's the kind of journalism, that's the kind of news that I wanted to see on my screen. I wanted to see on my paper. Uh, and it's NGOs and NPOs uh, that find this interesting because they are the ones who are at the front line to make progress, to respond to social problems, make changes, make things improved. And they are the ones who find the situation often frustrating that the, all the efforts and all the, all the progress they made uh, is not reflected to the news media, to the established news media, uh, established news channels, and it doesn't reach effectively to the, the end line uh, audiences and readers. So when you talk about solution journalism, this idea, it doesn't only speak to editors and reporters, but oftentimes uh, you, spark, you spark the flame to um, people at NGO, NPO, and the readers in general. Wonderful. Well, we have 30, 38, 39 people rushing mm. in. Um, so we might just Rushing make in. a gentle, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> we might make a gentle start. So if you wouldn't mind just heading to the next slide and I'll Absolutely. run through what we're planning to cover. Mm -hmm. So friends, what we're going to look at today is what solutions journalism is and also what it isn't um, mm -hmm. and how to do solutions journalism. And today is really a fundamentals and introduction to um, the basics of solutions journalism. And as I mentioned, we'll be doing some more in-depth training in 2024, which we're super excited about. Um, we'll have a look at how today um, solutions approaches can improve audience engagement and we'll touch on how it can support revenue targets. And we'll have some in-depth sessions on that next year. Uh, we will look at some case studies across formats. Um, and I want to uh, just mention right at the very beginning that one of the resources that you will all receive at the end of today um, is a PDF of every case study in today's deck. So we won't spend a whole lot of time um, jumping around tabs. Um, I'll be able to share those with you. Um, we'll look at common barriers to adoption um, and what sorts of resources exist so that you can spend some time over the summer beginning to get your head around this. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about a new Walkley Foundation Grants Program, um, which will sit in the context of that broader training next year. So the first thing is, have a look at the headings on this, the headlines on this page here, and think about how these headlines make you feel about the news, about the kind of content that you're consuming when you read the news, um, just the emotional reaction to that. And again, if you want to pop thoughts into the Q&A box um, rather than to the chat box, you're very um, welcome to, to do so. Um, I think what we are seeing um, is that people are finding that this sort of content makes them feel a bit negative. And uh, Q, if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide for me, please. So this is a uh, some results from a British study that was done on news avoidance and the most common reason people cite for avoiding news content is that it has a negative impact on their mood 
And the second most com common impact um, is that they don't feel like there's anything that they can do about a situation. Um, and those two things are more important in avoiding the news than um, lack of audience trust, for example, um, and so on. And so there are some points down below perhaps about concentration and so on that we think maybe those are things that are a factor, but in fact, the two most common things are it, it makes people feel unhappy and they don't feel like they can do anything about it. So how do we know this? Um, the Reuters Institute digital news reports, particularly the ones from last year and this year, um, have looked specifically at news avoidance and factors for news avoidance. Um, and there was also a major international conference on news avoidance, and I've linked to that. And as I say, I will um, share the links for everything um, that's in the slides today in a PDF, so you can quite easily click on it. And it's found that more than a third of people um, say they sometimes or, um, or often actively avoid the news um, and avoiding important stories such as the war in Ukraine um, and the cost of living crisis um, because people are cutting back on depressing news and looking to protect their mental health. So what solutions journalism is, and of course I'm going to defer for most of today's session to Q1 Lee, who is the manager of curriculum for uh, the Solutions Journalism Network and um, one of the trainers that helped bring me on this journey, um, is that in order to acquaint people with the news as a whole, we also need to be thinking about um, what's, what's the other half of the story? How are people solving problems? Um, so if you think about traditional news journalism as a deep dive into covering problems, solutions journalism is a deep dive into interrogating and looking at the responses to those problems in an evidence-based way. And with that in mind, I'm going to just hand over to, to Q on for the, um, most of the rest of this session. Over to you, Q. Most of the rest of the session. Thank yes. you, Corinne. <laughs> <laughs> I think Corinne uh, made an excellent point that it's the solution journalism is it could be a new thing to many of us but it it could be a slight change to our perspective to approach the news um green mentioned that um if the traditional journalism is about digging into what's wrong uh, what's so tro tro uh, troublesome what is so messed up um solution journalism is about uh the opposite approach uh oftentimes people call solution journalism an investigative reporting on what's going right instead of what's going wrong, that what we used to focus on. So for those of you who just joined in, you're talking about how these new news headlines make you feel. And you know, if you really stop um, for a second and think about it, these are the headlines, not unusual, but these are the headlines that we wake up to every morning, right? And here's, here's another scene. So, um, before I talk about what solution journalism is and what um, what is consistent of it, uh, here's another news headline to think about. And I think this kind of headline could be relevant when we are officially over with COVID-19, uh, right? So for example, Ebola came to the world as well. And it was one of the most recent pandemics before COVID-19, I'm sure. Many of you remember, right? Ebola, uh, this pandemic also took thousands of people's lives, but we are, as we all know, we are eventually out of it. But who knows, or how many um, around you, how many people in the general public, if you ask around, how many people know how Ebola was stopped or how that ended? I think, in, I think it's an important question because something, something must have happened and now we are out of Ebola, right? But not many people, if you ask around, uh, not the general public, or do you even know um, yourself? If you ask around, not our regular news audiences are aware of how we, as a global community, made Ebola stop. Uh, similar example here, do you know how China and Malar Malaysia eradicate malaria? Did you know? Or did you even know that they did this so? Or I flip, I tweak my question here a little bit. Do you think, I'm just reading the graph here. Do you think people in Ecuador uh, are well informed about those stories that defeated the disease from China or Malaysia? Um, Ecuadorian people, if you think about it, um, they know that their country has malaria. They live in it, right? Um, but um, 
do they know there are some cases out there that things could be better than those? If not, why is that? Here is a question to start off this all this conversation. And this is this is TV based research from the U.S. Uh, mentions of major TV, um, major events in TV news, and see. Um, and here are little texts here. See, it's from CNN, CNBC, Fox. So, you know, most of the established TV uh, news channels in the U.S. And see, when there's a shooting uh, or rally happens, let's see the graph here. When there's a natural disaster, suddenly all the TV news jumps onto the hype. Uh, every news channel talks about the event, but see what happens 10, 15 days after those events. Now, nobody really does, right? So if you think about that in the in the audience perspective, um, they know that some bad, unpleasant, or at least stressful things, if you like, happen. They know about it, but they are not adequately informed about what kind of responses and progress followed after those events because news professionals, which mean most of us in this room, news prof professionals don't talk about um, those responses to problems as much as we talk about shooting, hurricane, or or suicide, right? We tend to not follow up, especially when it comes to social and collective responses to problems. And here's another question added to it. Uh, do, do we think this kind of reporting uh, accurately reflects our world and society do people only make problems and do nothing do you think that's who we are um what is something this industry defines as newsworthy and if you can think of some of these things definitions of newsworthy do you agree what do you think here are the questions that i'm open opening up you with and with those questions here is a group of people, including Corinne and myself, who had who raised the same questions, similar questions. But you know, instead of just saying, "Oh yeah, journalism is terrible. We're doing all this," uh, readers hate us. Uh, people stop reading news. There's no hope in this industry, and it's just going to affect our democracy as well. Instead of just saying that, that this group of journalists, a small number of journalists, uh, started thinking. What if we report on problems? Of course, that's important, uh, the important role of journalism. Uh, but go beyond just reporting on problems. Go beyond just talking about problems repeatedly um, and do rigorous reporting on responses to social problems. And we tend to say that good solution reporting, good solution journalism uh, has these four pillars. And the four pillars are this. Good solutions reporting explains a response to a social problem, uh, what the response is and how it works. And it's really important to have the how element, how constituent in it. It presents evidence um, whether this response is effective or not. Um, and, and like any other reporting, it doesn't have to be solutions reporting, but any like any other good reporting, uh, ideally it has good amount and good depth of both quantitative and qualitative evidence in it. And I believe when it's done right, uh, and when it's done well, it's, it should be able to offer insights for those people who are reading your reporting. Uh, you remember Ecuadorian people reading about how China eradicated malaria, uh, they can gain some insights in order to apply those hows uh, to their own situation, to their own context, to solve, solve their own problem. And it explains limitations. You know, there's no perfect single solution that can solve everything at once, right? It could be costly, it could be expensive, it could take time, it could be applicable to one situation, but not another. So solution journalism, when done right, uh, has mm, include this uh, limitation of this given response. What's unknown ahead of this response as well. So I personally, I tend to believe that this is the part explaining limitations part is the is the space uh, where you can contribute the most, excel at most as a journalist angle. Uh, what are the limitations that readers need to know about this given response? Obviously, checking all the evidence and providing insights to your audience as well. So those are the four pillars. And Corinne mentioned at the beginning, uh, but we're going to share 
um, the contents, all the story links to uh, that we show show you today uh, in the slides afterward as a PDF file. So you probably don't have to worry too much about taking too many screenshots of those. Um, but yeah, those journalism response, evidence, insights, and limitation. All right. And here comes a little um, little fun part. So I talked briefly about what solution journals is, right? But if you're a person like me, if you're a student or a learner like me, I think it has something to do with different learning styles. Uh, and some of you like, are like me who usually learns a new thing uh, better by differentiating what it is from what it isn't. Uh, this part is for you. What's, what's not solution journals? So the first thing we want to avoid, uh, some of you were probably thinking of it in your head, but the first thing we want to avoid is simply doing hero worship. So if you read the headline on the on the left here, Miracle on the Ice, Doctor Saves Fellow Hockey Player's Life, may it might make a good story itself. So I'm not saying that this shouldn't be on news, but it's not what we classify as social journalism. Instead, uh, we want to use, or we rather want to focus on characters to talk about making systematic changes. So the story on the right also includes a group of doctors like how the story on the left does. But what this story spotlights is not just one doctor's instant or heroic action, but how the medical system, uh, government entities, and even some corporate entities, including many different professionals on the pro on the front line, how they collaborated to solve the given matter systematically. Uh, and it's not to, when we talk about solution journalism, it's not to find a silver bullet, kind of similar, uh, same comparison here. And you remember, uh, solution journalism needs to have a uh, limitation. Uh, need to, it needs to explain what, uh, what our limitations are in the given response, right? So here, both stories are about soccer ball. The story on the left, again, we're not saying that it's bad, but it's rather, it rather sounds like it's gonna, if you read the first line here or the headline, um, it rather sounds like it's gonna solve everything at once. What we are hoping to do is, yes, you can talk about a soccer ball as a response to a social problem. That's one way of, you know, storytelling. Uh, but what you want to do is, uh, you want to do that storytelling by telling the whole story, by giving the whole story on what the response does and does not achieve. So this soccer ball made with Crocs, as you can see here, um, so in the right, it can survive through really harsh conditions. That's good, uh, but it's not a silver bullet because there are limitations to it's expensive and you know it's it's hard to ship from point A, you know, from point A to point point B. So we want to include those limitations to our own solutions reporting as well. It's not a theory. So I, I myself love reading reports and articles coming out from academic institutes where think things. My, actually, my previous job before SJN Solution Journalism Network, it, it was at a think tank. So how can I not like it? But you remember, when we talk about solutions reporting, it needs to have evidence whether a certain response is working or not. And when it's only a theory, like this one on the left, they don't have the evidence, do they? Um, so we want to cover something that's already in process, um, even on a small scale. Um, so the one on the right, Iceland had a problem with teen drinking and they did something about it. It wasn't just a theory. It wasn't just, uh, you know, just a thought, a brand idea. Um, they did something about it actually. And with that, what can the experience of Iceland teach other countries? Now you can talk about that as a journalist, as a reporter to your audience. Hugh, just before you move on, um, we had a comment in the chat, which I think is worth bringing to the surface here, which is um, qualitative data versus anecdotal evidence. And if we just go back to the Iceland um, example for a moment there. Mm -hmm. There yep. you go. Great stuff. So once something is already in process, one of the reasons why it becomes a good candidate for a solution story is that you will have real, um, you know, real world uh, activities, real world you know, initiatives that you can measure. Um, and so that's a situation where you uh, can, um, I suppose, 
begin to get anecdotal evidence, but also begin to look at if uh, anyone is studying this and begin to get some qualitative um, data. You can also in introduce your own qualitative processes. So perhaps mm -hmm. you carry out a survey or you do some kind of report um, in collaboration, uh, if you can, with a tertiary provider so that you wind up with something that's more solid. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Wonderful. Thank you, Corinne. Taking care of the Q&A box, uh, it's, you know, you hard to check all the check uh, chats and Q and A box while sharing my screen. So, uh, you got me. All right, here's uh, another thing that's not solution journalism uh, or things that we don't categorize as solution journalism, and uh, it's not an afterthought. So it's easy for some people who just heard about solution journalism, and it's easy for those to misunderstand solution journalism as an afterthought like this. So for example, in a text-based article, if you think about it, you talk about the given problem in, I don't know, in 2000 words. And you finish, you wrap up, you finish the piece with a short note, short paragraph saying, by the way, uh, there are some people who are doing something about it. And that's you know more like an afterthought. So the documentary on the left is about two hour long and only the last five minutes hint at a few initiatives working to combat the given issue. So that's more like an effort that we're talking about. And again, we're not saying that this is a bad documentary. This is a superb documentary. I want you to watch it. It's an excellent one, but it's a little far from what we classify as solution journalism. Instead, we like to include solutions and responses part as a core part of the, part of the story. And it's not activism when we talk about solutions reporting. And you know, there are some articles when you scroll all the way down, uh, there's a little button at the bottom to donate for you to donate to be part of um, solving the problem. Again, we're not saying that it's bad, but that's just not what we call solutions, solutions journalism, uh, because instead what we want to do, what we want you to do is reporting on responses to problems. And finally, uh, I think we may come back to this point a couple of times again. Uh, it's not it's not just fluffy news. It's not just happy news. Lovely Sunday morning cat and dog story. Um, it may result in happiness or a positive feeling in people's emotion, uh, but that's not the goal of doing solution journalism. I I tend to believe that. Um, so we are not talking about simply happy news, lovely news, uplifting news. I mean, these are heartwarming cat story, you know, a neighborhood saving a cat. Um, it's heartwarming, it makes us feel good, but it's not about making systematic changes, right? We wouldn't call this solution journalism. And I assume you are, uh, if you are in this room, in this webinar room, you are clear about that, right? Yeah, we're talking about rigorous reporting on responses to social problems. So by this point, you kind of understand um, what solution journalism is. And again, it's kind of hard for me to check the Q&A box uh, while speaking and sharing my screen, but I believe we are going to have a 15 to 20 minute um, toward the end of session for Q&A, right? Okay. So by this point, you kind of understand what it is, right? So this section is about why. Why doing solution journalism is a pretty cool idea. Or if you are already practicing it, uh, how you can tell others that it's a pretty cool idea, right? So the first reason comes with the potential of solution journalism to hold the powerful accountable. And I'm not sure how many of you in this room, there are about 50 people in this room, and I, I don't know how many of you have seen this movie called Spotlight. I wish I was talking to you in person, face to face, to see your hand raised or see your faces, but I don't know. Um, Corinne, have you seen this movie? Spotlight. Absolutely. Yep. You I've have. seen this movie. It's a great film. Yep. It, it is a great film. Uh, I think five or six Academy Award winner uh, based on a true story. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Great uh, film music as well. And um, Martin Baron, one of the key characters in the movie, and a real life human being because it's based on a true story. He says here the role of journalism, many of, many of us journalists would root for, holding the most powerful to account. And if you ask around uh, your journalist fellows why you became a journalist, 
it's probably one of the most frequent, most common answers to hold the powerful, to bad guys, to hold the strong guys accountable, right? And this is one of the examples I have about how solution journalism can hold the most powerful accountable. It's a, it's a news series uh, by a newsroom called Cleveland Plain Dealer in the US, in Ohio. And it's about lead poisoning issue uh, in the city where the newsroom is based, Cleveland. Lead meaning, um, you know, the, the chemical element. Um, you don't see my wall here, but the, anyways, the chemical element in paint that is particularly toxic to children in pregnant women. So they were covering this issue in the city. So initially, as journalists, um, they had played the watchdog part for a long time. They found the problem, they, they defined the problem, um, and based on those, they informed the readers, they informed the citizens, officials about this lead poisoning problem all over the city. But uh, when you do it for years and decades, they did it so, uh, but, but you still have the same problem of lead poisoning all over the city. What happens? People just stop listening, stop reading, because they know that there's a problem, but they don't know what can be, what can be done about it. People you know, your readers, people get frustrated, your citizens, people feel powerless. So what the Cleveland Plain Dealer did in 2015 differently was to now starting playing a guide dog part, not just the watchdog, but now a guide dog. They started to look at other cities with similar characteristics and with the same problem of lead poisoning and try to see how these other cities address the problem within these various aspects. You see, they now look at how Rochester responded to its lead poisoning problem. And they took each measure from different aspects and try to understand how things are working in successful cities. And they compared the measures taken from successful cities to, to Cleveland. For example, lead inspection of homes in successful cities, it's done before uh, children get poisoned. Whereas it, in Cleveland, it was after, you follow the chart here, testing of children um, in successful cities. They did it before symptoms emerge, whereas in Cleveland, they did it only after. So people now can see not only how Cleveland was doing poorly in its lead poisoning issue, uh, but also they can now see how other cities were doing better. So solution journalism, again, is about this, not simply pointing out what's wrong, but going beyond that to looking at who's doing it, who's doing it better. What happened after this coverage in Cleveland? High ranking city officials who were in charge got fired. The number of lead inspection staff rose from three to seven, so more than doubled. The city passed a plan to proactively inspect rental homes, et cetera. And Cleveland City Council also passed what they call historic lead poisoning prevention law, which you can look it up yourself. Uh, and the list of this impact of this um, solution series goes on and on and on until even today. And we also said that there's an uh, audience engagement side in why doing solution journalism as well. Nine years ago, Seattle Times decided to create this education vertical, and it's again still ongoing, by the way. And this article, for example, talks about a school district that had this problem of chronic truancy. Students, you know, at school, they miss class. So they weren't able to graduate, right? But instead of what they did differently was instead of simply talking about the problem of you know, student chronic truancy, uh, what they did was that they also focused on, they also spotlighted uh, one, how this one school district overcame the problem as well. And they let their readers know about it. And the impact of this, um, you know, flipping perspective, impact of it was quite, Phenomenal. 62% of readers agree that the story changed the way they think about the topic. 84% of educators said they were likely to talk to someone else about the vertical. Page views increased. So did people's time on page. More social shares, more returning user rate. And the publication, the Seattle Times, after this vertical, got its own fiscal sponsor by Alaska Airlines to spread the solution stories. Uh, when audiences were given two types of stories, one with traditional problem-only story, you know, centered around 
negativity oftentimes, and the other with solutions angle. Uh, and the result here is quite fascinating. You see a uh, non-solution story, problem story in blue circle, orange solution story. Result here is quite fascinating. With the solution story, people responded, they feel more inspired, more likely to read articles from the same newspaper, more likely to share the article as well. Uh, people's time on page is up on solution stories. And if you think about why, why is that? Uh, you, you know, when an article is about problem, problem, problem from the from the headline to the to the end as a reader. And we are all familiar with that kind of you know story structure, right? And as a reader, at this point, you don't even have to be a journalist. As a reader, you'd be like, okay, I get it. It's it's terrible, you're saying. You scroll down, feeling, I don't know, feeling frustrated, perhaps. Whereas if the article on the same issue talks about problem, of course, but also about who's better coping with the problem and and how. And with evidence, remember the solutions for qualities or solution journalism four pillars. You probably pay attention to it, right? Because imagine if you are a, if you are a citizen, if you are a parent in in Cleveland City, um, you want your kids to be safe from lead poisoning. It's obvious, right? And you want to push your city officials based on solid grounds, based on solid evidence, you know, undisputable from other places. You want to tell your friends and family members that there are some examples some cases out there that things can be better so time on page up on solution stories versus problem only stories chattanooga times free press did this great solution series called the public puzzle on which they received more unsolicited um input from the community than anything else they have done time on page again was phenomenal and uh, you know, I, I myself, I'm a journalist too, and I've reported on things from, from hearing so gender issues to cyber to security, North Korea, I don't know. North Korea, it's, it's one thing that you regularly do when you are a journalist in South Korea. So, and you'll know what I'm talking about. So oftentimes, most of the times, actually, the comment section to your coverage, you know, usually at the bottom, the comment from your readers, um, that section is that space is usually not the most ideal place uh, where you can find the most constructive or most health healthiest discussion about the given topic uh, going on, right? But look what happened here with the solution story. No one in the newsroom can believe the civility of the Facebook comments. Something kind of exciting is happening with this. Trust between papers and the readers can be can be rebuilt. Nice Martin, a daily newspaper in France, almost went bankrupt, I mean, financially, and they had one final shot left. They asked their readers, what do you guys want us to do? The readers responded, responded solution journalism. Uh, so the publication listened to the readers. Subscription, page visit, time on page, 70, 300, 400% increased. Same thing with another French magazine uh, who found their solutions-oriented issue, the best issue of the year. So in in summary, it's solution journalism. It, it's you know, it's kind of useful to fight the bad news fatigue uh, your readers are having, but actually all of us are experiencing. It gives some self efficacy, you know. Remember that when people read solutions uh, oriented news, they feel more inspired to be part of the. Uh, part of the solving of the given issue. And it was trust between news uh, and audience. So here are a quick summary of why solution journalism is, why doing solution journalism is a pretty cool idea. And I'm gonna now hand off to Corinne. So if you feel the same way that some of these journalists do, and if you feel like you wanna do it on your reporting as well, your upcoming or current reporting as well, how you can do it. Um, Corinne is gonna walk us through it. Thanks, Q. Uh, awesome. So uh, it's actually fairly straightforward, really. Um, and so we think about what's missing from the public conversation. If we go back to the quote earlier in this um, session from Tina Rosenberg about the whole story, um, it's not just covering problems, it's also covering responses to those problems. Um, and so when we think about public conversation, is there an awareness of the problem? 
um, no, then uh, maybe there's a need to do traditional mm -hmm. news journalism around that topic. Um, and sometimes people ask, does solutions journalism replace news journalism? And of course it doesn't. Um, what it does is allows us to then um, look at what the root causes of some of those um, problems are. Um, we also obviously need to continue to cover um, stories that perhaps don't have an easy response, um, for example, international conflicts, um, recessions, etc. cetera. Um, so there's news journalism. But if there is an awareness of the potential responses, um, then you can think, okay, well, perhaps I can start to look at ways of, of covering the, um, responses to this problem in a way that um, can build some pressure on uh, decision makers who can implement those responses locally to think maybe we will do this, which is the example that we saw earlier from um, the Cleveland Plain dealer around lead paint. So it's not advocacy. It's making sure that your audience is aware of responses to problems um, in a way that they can then make more informed decisions about their lives. So it's not all gloom and doom. It's also understanding that there are ways of responding to this thing um, and that they can then advocate for or make their voices heard at the, at the polling station. So you're identifying your issue or, or question of concern. Think about what's missing from the public conversation and then start looking for candidates for solution stories. So if we think about what makes a, a response newsworthy, right? So what's newsworthy from a solutions lens? It responds to something that, that affects your audience. Um, so where I live um, in the Illawarra, which is a couple of hours south of Sydney, um, you know, there are big conversations at the moment um, around wind farms, for example. Uh, you know, there are plans to build offshore wind farms. Does that solve a problem that affects the audience? And also what what is the best way of dealing with clean energy in that part of the world? Is the thing more sustainable than what's offer on offer? Is it more equitable? Uh, is it a response that would be um, more affordable or more accessible? Is it a response that benefits specific groups within your community um, where those are coming up in conversation quite a bit? For example, this is going to be good for our young people or the marginalised community in our area. Um, it's going to benefit refugees um, in a way that we're not currently, or women, or people living with a disability. Um, perhaps it's something that will work really well in remote communities or regional communities, um, or it addresses a need that's felt by the, earl the elderly. So these are some of the specific groups that you think, actually, maybe someone's working on a response um, that would be beneficial either locally or they're doing it somewhere else like the example of France um, that we might look at here and then we're thinking about interviewees in a slightly different way so you might look for responses from think tanks and policy experts or academic experts uh, you might look into large data sets uh, to get the qualitative data that you need uh, you can talk to people who are involved in implementing a response not to do a hero feature on that person but more to think about if we go back to the four pillars of solutions journalism what is the evidence that that person or that or that organization has and also what kinds of limitations have they run into and can they provide enough information that this could be done somewhere else you might look to networks of innovators um, you could talk to program officers in foundations or um, NGOs, for example. It just helps you hold a mirror up to your own life too, to say, well, who do I know that's working on this? Um, and there is also um, the Solutions Journalism Tracker, which um, Q1 will tell us about in a little bit. So in traditional journalism, we, we typically go, well, this just happened um, or this bad thing just happened in particular. So some of the angles you could explore are comparisons. Who's got the same problem as us and what are they doing? Would it work here? And sometimes a thing that will work in one place won't work terribly well if it's just pick up and cookie cutter, but it might be adapted here. Um, you could look at an angle of who has seen change in this over time in a way that's that's solving that problem or going some way towards solving that problem. Um, you can ask questions around best, best practice. So perhaps we're doing something here, but it's being done even better over there. So how are we developing a, an idea of best practice? Let's think also about who's benefiting, right? So we often think we'll follow the money and that's important, but also if we think about who's benefiting from a particular response, is it really benefiting 
um, our elderly or our children? Are we finding that there's a response somewhere else that in fact addresses those communities in a better way? Um, is it cost effective, right? So fixing some problems is expensive. Some problems are very expensive. So who has managed to do this affordably? Um, is it an effective policy? So rather than a potential policy, or maybe your town or um, community is looking at introducing a policy, that's not yet in process, right? So it's not a solution yet from a solutions journalism perspective. But let's say your community is looking at implementing a policy that's already in place somewhere else. That's a good moment to think about it as a solution story. And finally, fairness. Is um, a, a particular response reducing inequality in a marginalised community or a specific niche group? You can also go to your audience. So you can canvas um, for issues as uh, Nice Maton did. What do you want us to do? And people said, we'd like you to talk about fixing things or who's fixing things, not, not fixing things, but who's fixing them in a way that we can then take decisions about. Um, you can also ask for input. So we've done lots of stories on this topic. Um, who have you seen that's doing a job of, of responding to that topic? And also you can ask for insights and evidence that you're going to need to demonstrate to the audience as a whole what's working about this and also what isn't. So quick quiz, um, and I know we've disabled the chat, but I am going to ask you to pop it into the Q&A. Um, we have three or uh, four solutions, uh, four, sorry, four topics on the screen there. Are any of these solutions angles? So a new grant or funding, proposed legislation, a new task force, or an exciting coalition between two groups to respond to something? Can anyone think if this is a solutions angle? Are any of them? I'll give you a couple of seconds. Let's see if anything comes into the Q&A box. Bianca says, oh, we've got one legislation and coalition, maybe. Might get one more. All of them have the potential. Well, friends, I have bad news for you, if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide. None of them are. And the reason is that they're, they're an idea or a theory or a plan. So the funding might not have the effect that, that is wanted. Um, we've got a couple of there. Uh, yep, my, uh, we've got a response here. Nothing has happened yet. Exactly. Nothing has happened yet. The task force not, might not work out. The legislation might not lead to change. The coalition might, might crash and burn and nothing will come of it. So it's not an evidence-based assessment of a solution, but they might be implemented elsewhere and be part of your solutions angle. So some questions that you can ask your interviewees. What's the problem you're trying to solve rather than what's just happened? How does your response work? Where did the idea come from? It's always nice to know where something has originated from because that will give you more comparisons. What's your evidence that it is effective? And how are you measuring success? That might deliver you the qualitative data that you need. Um, what isn't working or what needs improvement? You know, um, one of the things that I have really enjoyed about um, understand, coming to a better understanding of solutions journalism is that the word solution in some ways um, is a bit of a misnomer because we're really thinking about responses, right? There's no magic bullet. There's no perfect solution. You might fix a problem uh, but open up others or you might fix some elements of it and think, you know what, we could actually do quite a lot more now that we've got this far. So there's always room for iterative improvement. A question you could ask is, could you replicate this elsewhere? Um, and what would be the barriers to that? Um, if it's working, you can ask, how are you going to scale this? So you've got it working here. How would you scale it? And then what's next? How do you avoid being an advocate? Well, the first thing is don't overclaim, right? So don't call it a magic bullet or it's going to fix everything. Don't overclaim. Provide the context and the relevance. The context is things like, what's working, what's not, what are the limitations, what's your evidence. Focus on the response rather than the person or the organisation, otherwise it's hero worship. Insist on getting the evidence, right? That's the answer. When we're thinking about the, you know, this person has to answer that question um, in traditional journalism, that would be, did this happen, yes or no? Were you responsible, yes or no? In solutions journalism is, do you have the evidence, yes or no? Um, and then avoid the words at the bottom of the screen there. 
Now, um, I am going to share with you all a wonderful PDF um, linking to all of the case studies on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind just opening that up. Um, I'll just talk to a couple of them momentarily. Um, the ABC podcast, Who's Going to Save Us, um, is a show that's been developed um, to look specifically at climate issues from a solutions perspective. Um, I think also one of the things I'm asked quite often as a trainer is, can you do solutions journalism in anything other than long form text? And the answer is actually, yes, you can. You can do it for social media. Um, I've seen some great case studies where a series of Instagram posts might be used to tell a story that needs multiple um, and nuanced elements to it. Um, you can also do short form text, television news, even in a minute 30, you can take a solutions approach. Um, and so there are some great examples there. And as I mentioned, links to all the case studies um, will be circulated after the session. Um, and if you're looking for inspiration, Q, where can people find these things? If you are looking for inspirations, uh, one um, channel that you can find those uh, is SGN's Solution Story Tracker. Um, if you can share the link in the chat box, Corinne, or I can share the link absolutely after the webinar with all of you. But um, I said earlier that there is a small number of journalists who think the same, that solution journalism is uh, worth an idea to try out. It actually grew to thousands of, thousands of journalists around the world and who are regularly practicing um, this way of reporting social issues. And you can find um, those uh, solution journalism reporting examples um, on this curated database, free online database. Uh, you don't even have to log in or sign up for anything. You can just type your uh, interest, type your topic of interest in the in the search box, and then it's gonna give you uh, those solution journalism stories collected from all around the world. Currently, I think over it says twenty thousand nine hundred, but I think it's it's over thirteen thousand or even fourteen thousand at the moment. Um, so look it up, try out yourself, and um, there you go. Um, there's a link in the chat box, and if you like. There are this, even this advanced search function that you can sort out stories by news outlet, by a particular journalist that you are um, aware of, uh, stories that are done by student journalists. Uh, one of my favorite function is this location of response. So for example, I tend to look up um, stories uh, that report on responses uh, that happened in Asia, my back region, um, or language function as well. It's primarily centered around English, but we are now growingly have more uh, stories that are done in not English, non-English, uh, for example, Spanish. There are over 100 stories, uh, French as well. You can try out all these events on search function too. And you can find these um, story collections as well that are curated by SGN staff members uh, around specific topics of interest of yours. Uh, these are common barriers that you may face or your colleagues may face when trying to practice solution journalism on the front line, in newsroom, on the ground. Common barriers are like this. Um, simply, you don't know how to do it, how to do solution journalism training resources practice feedback that's the reason why an organization like us exists so come to us um tell us what you need uh, and let us know how we can help you to practice solution journalism uh, and there is a network of journalists you remember there are already six thousand journalists who produce solution stories around the world those are all all your allies uh, in practicing solution journalism so remember that what are other barriers? Your editor may see it as a fluff, PR. It's a long, I mean, it's, I have to admit, it's not a simple conversation to have. It might take longer than you may expect to, you know, let them feel the same way that you do about solutions reporting. But, you know, beginning, you can start by having this discussion that solution journalism includes evidence and limitation of the given response. That could be a 
uh, start of the conversation. But I'm happy to, again, um, chat further and deeper about how to talk with social journalists, the necessity of it um, with, with your editor. Audience doesn't understand it. Uh, you can flag, you can um, signpost your solutions reporting, what you're trying to do, what you are doing in your reporting. Uh, you can tell um, the intention, the purpose of solutions reporting and the benefit of it to your audience upfront. So a, a bit of explainer about what you're trying to achieve with your solutions reporting. Audience doesn't recognize it, similar line. You can flag, you can signpost, and we have resources about uh, newsrooms and journalists, um, case study resources uh, who have done it past uh, in the past, uh, done it before in their newsroom. So we can share those insights and some steps they've taken with you as well. Business case unclear, unclear we also have um, resources to share with you around that. And above all, we'll cover these common barriers, how to some of the ways, some of the effective ways, proven ways uh, in the past um, next training, uh, next year's training in 2024 with you um, on around impact, around um, applying solutions lens to covering um, diverse communities around audience engagements. We are gonna do webinars um, around those issues in the next year as well. So please stay tuned with the Walkley Foundation and Corinne in this room. I'm super excited. Just if we just bounce back to that for just for one second, um, Q1. Uh, I think we've talked a little bit about the business case today, uh, and we will have uh, some specific sessions on those on those topics next year. I think not just because it's important for individual reporters who are interested in um, engaging in solutions journalism to get permission or buy in from their editor. Um, or if you're a freelancer, if you're wanting to pitch a solutions angle, it helps to be able to make a case to the commissioning editor. But also from the perspective of sustainable journalism businesses, um, we will also be looking at how you package some of this uh, some of this information um, that you would have seen in the AB testing slide. Um, and some of the impact tracking so that you can package that up for your advertisers um, or if you're looking at um, engaging philanthropic support for your reporting to potential donors. I think one of the uh, case studies um, that st stood out for uh, me from earlier in the, in the deck um, was the decision by Alaska Airlines to sponsor the education lab at the Seattle Times. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing some of these kinds of partnerships emerge where there's a, um, a comfortable fit between an external brand um, and a media outlet and a target audience, right? So there's that sort of win-win-win triangle. And where you have that, where the brand values align, um, it is possible to package this up for um, an advertiser, which I think is really um, exciting because we are seeing a decline um, in advertising revenue and if there's any way that we can bring some of that back into funding what we do because good journalism costs money um, that's important and so that these common barriers and responses have very much uh, informed the design of the training that we'll be doing next year so we do have some questions but let's let's finish off the slides and then we'll um, address some questions let's finish up the slides um, <laughs> resources yes yeah, here's a link to, again, we are going to share the link with all the participants in this room. Here's a link to Solution Journals Network, impact tracking. So what kind of impact um, this solutions reporting has created? And we sort of compiled this impact uh, from around the world um, to show you in a concise way, an impact tracking guide as well for your own you know, newsroom impact tracking, for your own impact tracking as a journal individual journalist. Constructive Institute, uh, another organization who is doing a similar work as we do, uh, but based in Denmark. From Insight to Im Impact by uh, European Journalism Center. So there are rather an overwhelming amount um, of resources we can share with you, but we make sure to we'll make sure to share um, all of those with you after the webinar. I will just speak to a couple of those quickly. One of the things that uh, I've noticed, so I've been working in journalism training, um, gosh, coming up for 11 years now, and one of the things that I'm very aware of um, is that you guys are incredibly time poor. 
Um, and so the resources that uh, we'll share with you, uh, both from this session and over the coming months, really are curated with a view to being um, actionable and implementable quickly. So, um, I mean, you're very welcome to, to read long research reports and there will be some of those, but they'll be flagged as such. Uh, but, you know, this guide that uh, the EJC, the European Journalism Centre, put together from insight to impact is short, bite-sized, and it's designed to be put straight into practice. Similarly, the new impact tracking guide, which um, has just recently been published, I think, Kewan, that's a, um, a resource that's been prepared for the network by uh, the Fathom Consultancy. Um, that is fine. Yeah, it's, it's very straightforward, and it's something that you could print out, share with your colleagues, um, and it's, you know, it's good to go straight away. And it, again, it's been produced by um, former journalists. So um, it's ready to rock. Let's start taking some questions. Um, Q, there are some great questions in the Q&A box. So mm -hmm. if you just go into that and I'll see if I can fix the settings on the form while we're doing that. There's some terrific ones there from starting off with sure. Awa. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm answering all the permission ask in the question box. Check marked, check marked. There's a question from Awa, and I'm gonna read it for the entire room. So traditional news journalism is often built on the assumption that conflict makes a good story. Hmm. However, experience has shown this can be limiting. What are some other assumptions that could replace this? What role does solution journalism play and shifting assumptions beyond the traditional conflict narrative? Hmm, that's a good question, I think. And again, I wish I was in a room, in a physical room, um, facing you in person to have a more complicated discussion and, you know, more delicate discussion, a conversation about this. But I'd like to ask you back what you think, first of all. But if you ask my perspective, I think I may want to start from where this where this assumption is coming from, what it, where it is based off. Why do we think traditional news journalism has a favor over conflict-driven story? What do we find uh, that's the case? Why, why is that? And if I have to ask myself, who also used to be in a traditional um, newsroom as well, I think there is a tendency, there is an assumption that your tr traditional news professionals have um, that conflict makes story more interesting, more engaging, more gripping to their audience. And if if the assumption is coming from people's interest, I can I can show you there are a myriad of solution journalism stories that that was done with you know thrill, with excitement, uh, with tweaks and um, so people make pe that make people curious about what's going to happen next uh, by telling people there there are some challenges that these people had to go through to make this response work and to go through all those challenges to achieve those. So if that's the case, I think um, one way we could make solution journalism interesting is by uh, explaining and spelling out those challenges. The people who are on the ground, the people who are affected by the problem, people who try to solve the problem had to face, and how they overcame uh, with those challenges. And that way, you know, it could be, it could be interesting. Your story could be. And if if I think of beyond that point, um, so there's 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 this metaphor about solution journalism. Let's say it's a it's a metaphor that our co-founder, David Bernstein, um, uh, likes to say oftentimes. And let's say it's a good doctor, bad doctor metaphor. And if if we see our roles as a journalist is a doctor to our society, let's say. And imagine you go into a doctor's room, doctor's appointment, and your doctor tells you how bad your health situation is using 15 minutes of appointment time, how how much trouble you're having right now, um, your diet, your habit, um, and all these things gonna make you make you die in uh, <laughs> if you keep this habit, you're gonna you're gonna die in 20 years, you're gonna die in 10 years, five years, who knows? And while that kind of doctor may exist, if 
you are a patient and what you want to also hear from your doctor is that, okay, I know that my health condition is bad and I, I cannot keep my, you know, my habit this way, but tell me what are the, you know, what are the possibilities? How, how other people who have been in the same situation as me uh, gotten better? I mean, you, you got to tell me about those, those past, those, you know, examples, those ways as well. So that's a, if we see our role as journalists, a doctor to our society, I mean, of course, bad stories about bad health may be interesting to some others, but that's not the end of the end of the story. Uh, where the story gotta end, we we may have to explain better about how things could be uh, could be better. Taraj, you you asked a question here. Um, how is it possible to uh, use solutions journalism? Um, and implement the four pillars in every news, especially current affairs or news updates. I think it's really important to remember that solutions journalism does not replace traditional journalism. You should think about it as augmenting it. For us to have the whole story, we um, we can do what we've always done, which is to, to tell people about things that are of concern or, or worry or they should know about it because it's important. That includes things like um, conflict, crime, corruption, um, but at the same time, you know, no no sensible person wants to live in a, in an environment of constant conflict, crime, corruption, and so who's coming up with ways of responding to those things? So that is when you need your four pillars, right? So I hope that helps answer that question. Now here is our announcement. Um, so in twenty twenty four, we're super excited to, um, you can just open up the whole screen there, Q. Um, so today we've looked at learning the fundamentals of solutions journalism. Um, we are partnering with the Solutions Journalism Network um, on the training element um, that will be delivered next year. Um, and so for those of you who are in Australia and also outside Australia, you are extremely welcome to attend all eight. It'll be a total of eight sessions. Um, that will cover the following. So um, today it was the fundamentals, making a business case for solutions journalism, using solutions journalism to strengthen your audience relationships. And that's things like time on the page and loyalty and trust and willingness to support you um, and your journalism. Then a session specifically on delivering and measuring impact. And I'm delighted to um, share that we'll be working with um, one of Q1's colleagues, Alex Salins, um, who'll be engaging um, some folks from an organization called Impact Architects to deliver that session. So we'll really be digging into um, measurements of success. We do know um, that, you know, journalism in, in the digital age is all about the metrics. So what are the metrics that you need to be capturing uh, for a solution story? And then we will look at that um, from the perspective of what do we need to change about newsroom practice to accommodate the um, practice of solutions journalism, the metrics around it, but also so that we can demonstrate that externally. And so there'll be a session specifically on packaging solutions as a product for audiences and for, um, for donors um, and for other financial stakeholders like advertisers. Um, the final session in August next year will be with grantees. Um, and so in February, we will be announcing um, a program of 10 to 15 grants, um, modest grants of between three and five thousand dollars to help Australian based only reporters to do a solutions uh, focused story. And so there'll be more information about that in February. Um, and at the end of the program, we want to hear from the grantees um, to see how they're getting on with their story and also what they've learned as a result of implementing solutions journalism in their newsrooms. So we're hoping um, that this will be something of a game changer to um, bring solutions journalism um, in the context of best practice uh, to um, Australian journalists and also to benefit journalists outside Australia. Uh, and that's why we're doing it as a a series of webinars and meetings. So um, you can see Q, um, well, my email is on there, Q, I might just hand over to you. Um, that literally is all from me for today. Um, so Q, if you'd like to wrap us up and uh, if anyone needs to get in touch, um, our email addresses are at the bottom there. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Corinne. It was lovely to be in this webinar room with you and with all of you of almost 50 attendees from different time zones. Um, 
I I visited Australia for for the first time in my life just this July, um, for my summer break. I mean, it was winter up there, and I told myself, ah, I I'm I'm definitely coming back. And it felt like today's session felt like sort of coming back to Australia. Um, this time for professional purpose. Um, but yeah, uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, we are we are here for you. We are here to collaborate with um journalism students, journalists uh, in general on the ground, obviously individual journalists, freelance, newsroom journalists, uh, newsrooms around the world, uh, journalism institutes. So whatever the context that you are, you have joined this room um, from, uh, don't hesitate to stay in touch with us and let us know how we can help your solutions journalism project, journey, reporting. And uh, yeah, it, if, you actually end up producing a solutions journalism story. Remember the solution story tracker? Uh, you can actually name your story to the tracker yourself. So let us know and um, let us know how we can promote your awesomeness in the solution journalism journey to the world. Thank you all. <laughs>